So for this video, I want to provide you with some background about Coleridge. I want to provide you with some background about Kubla Khan. I'll take you through a reading of the poem and then a short explanation of it. You will still have to answer the questions or complete the annotations for the poem. My explanation will not give you all of the information you need to answer those, but it should give you uh, some support so that you can come up with your own understandings and interpretations. We're starting with Samuel Taylor Coleridge because he is considered really the founder of the Romantic movement. Many of the other poets, poets that we'll read um, count him as an influential figure. Initially, Coleridge was to become a member of the clergy, but while at university, his beliefs, political, religious, social, philosophical, all changed, and eventually he would leave school with his degree unfinished. Many of his early poetic works followed typical poetic conventions, but Coleridge began to experiment with poetic form, with uh, different ways of writing, especially after befriending William Wordsworth, which is the next poet that we'll be working with. Uh, and this is why we count him as the founder of the Romantic movement. Remember, in the Restoration, everything was so concerned with form and structure, and now you see a writer beginning to experiment with form and structure, beginning to emphasize the ideas of creativity and emotional expression. Now, Kubla Khan was written while Coleridge was on holiday in the countryside. So the story goes, supposedly he was reading a book about the exotic Xanadu, Kublai Khan's summer palace, and he fell into a dream, probably because of the doctor prescribed dose of opium he took. Now, apparently while he dreamed, he composed this long poem, but his dream was interrupted by a visitor. This is, according to Coleridge, what we're going to read, just a fragment of the longer poem. Now, you can decide whether this is an accurate story about the creation of this poem, whether this truly seems like just a fragment of something that was imagined, or whether there's much more careful consideration in its creativity. Consider all the overlapping and connected imagery and the amount of alliteration that's in here. With that in mind, I'm going to take you through a reading of it. Now, I'll do my best with it, but like I said, there's a lot of uh, alliteration in here, so I'll do my best. Um, there are other readings posted for you on Schoology. You can also access an audio version via your online textbook. All right. Kubla Khan by Samuel Taylor Coleridge, or A Vision in a Dream, a Fragment. In Xanadu did Kublai Khan a stately pleasure dome decree, where Alf, the sacred river, ran through caverns measureless to man down to a sunless sea. So twice five miles of fertile ground with walls and towers were girdled round, and there were gardens bright with sinuous rills where blossomed many an incense-bearing tree, and here were forests ancient as the hills enfolding sunny spots of greenery. But oh, that deep romantic chasm which slanted down a green hill athwart a cedarn cover, a savage place, as holy and enchanted as e'er beneath a waning moon was haunted by a woman wailing for her demon lover. And from this chasm with ceaseless turmoil seething, as if this earth in fast thick pants were breathing, a mighty mountain momently was forced, amid whose swift half intermittent burst huge fragments vaulted like rebounding hail or chaffy grain beneath the thresher's fail and mid these dancing rocks at once and ever it flung up momently the sacred river five miles meandering with a mazy motion through wood and dale the sacred river ran then reached the caverns measureless to man and sank in tumult to a lifeless ocean and mid this tumult kubla heard from afar ancestral voices prophesying war the shadow of the dome of pleasure floated midway on the waves where was heard the mingled measure from the fountain in the caves. It was a miracle of rare device, a sunny pleasure dome with caves of ice. A damsel with a dulcimer in a vision once I saw. It was an Abyssinian maid, and on her dulcimer she played, singing of Mount Abora. 
could I revive within me her symphony and song to such a deep delight would win me that with music loud and long I would build that dome in air that sunny dome those caves of ice and all who heard should see them there and all should cry beware beware his flashing eyes his floating hair weave a circle round him thrice and close your eyes with holy dread for he on honey dew hath fed and drunk the milk of paradise so this poem's divided into four sections, and I'll take you through a brief explanation of each section. So we start here in with the uh, description of Xanadu, of the, the pleasure dome, the palace that Kublai Khan built. And these are all beautiful images of nature. You've got the fertile ground, the bright garden, um, blossoming trees, sunny spots, lots of natural imagery, lots of beautiful nature. Uh, notice that it's a garden that's being described as an earthly paradise. We'll come back to that idea at the end. And think a lot about this imagery, how this landscape would look. There are lots of opposites here. Uh, you have walls and towers compared to all of the nature, and then you can also think about towers standing up versus the sunny hills, that kind of thing. Now the second section describes the river, that sacred river that was mentioned in the first section that runs through this area. Uh, but the tone has changed, and I think the tone is changed here, indicated by the punctuation that you see used. Uh, it really describes the movement of this sacred river. It's violent at first. We have it being um, like forced out in a, in, in a fountain. Uh, bursts is the word that's used in here. Uh, we've got ceaseless turmoil. So again, we've got sets of opposites. This, the, the feeling in this section, the mood of this section, as indicated by the word choice, um, compared to the mood of the first section. Uh, the imagery here too, with the river in this section versus the imagery of um, the first section. There's a lot of alliteration and imagery here that will mimic the uh, river's motion. Uh, so at first this river is violent, violently being forced out of the earth. Then it meanders through the woods and then eventually it sinks down into this uh, cave that's measureless to man. The third section is very short. It's just a short set of six lines, but these six lines serve to link the first two sections. Uh, whoever is seeing this, whoever is describing this, is seeing, is supposedly looking at the shadow of the pleasure dome that would maybe be the reflection of it in the water. Uh, hearing the crashing of the fountain, noticing those caves of ice, but in, in short, experiencing all of the imagery that was um, included in the beginning part of the of the poem. Okay, finally this last section introduces two characters, the speaker and a damsel playing a dulcimer. Now look at what she is singing of. Make sure that you're looking at the footnotes. Everything that's highlighted in yellow is footnoted. Make sure you're looking at the footnote for Mount Abora and then revisit that idea at the beginning of the poem of the setting being this earthly paradise. Now, he ends this poem with a kind of wish or a, an if-then statement. He says, could I revive within me her symphony and song, then I would build that dome in the air. So it's, if I could do that, then I would do this. In other words, if he could, if I could remember, or our speaker in this case, if the speaker could remember or relive her song or her inspiration, then he could also create amazing wonders. So it's possible that even though he claims this poem was just a dream, it's more like a, like a metaphor for the overall creative process, especially when you consider the end of the poem, it's almost a warning. Uh, beware, beware, can you command creative genius or does it control the person? Think about the, the movement of the river in this sense. It's violently explodes and then it kind of meanders and then it just drops off. So is, 
in that case, this river that runs through this whole poem could be maybe a metaphor for the entire creative process. And with that in mind, consider the uh, story about this poem's creation. Do you really think Coleridge just completely dreamed this up or does it seem a little bit better crafted than that? Okay, I hope that helps you.